The Leadership League. Brought to you by Turkish Airlines. You have these, these brothers. They're not your family, but they are sort of another form of family. They're your sporting family. And, and you don't choose them going in. You get landed with them for the rest <laughs> of your life, come, come hell or high water. And when we're walking by the river here, how does it make you feel? I'm very at peace with it. It's not difficult to be at peace. You know, that's what the river does for everybody. But for me particularly, I don't have any hankering to go back. Welcome to the Leadership League. I'm Tanya Breyer and I'm in central London making my way to the banks of the River Thames to meet one of the greatest living oarsmen along one of the most iconic stretches of water in British rowing history. Matthew Pinsent has spent much of his racing career on just one river. Competitive rowing on the Thames dates back to the late 17th century. By the early 1800s, university students from Oxford and Cambridge began racing each other with the first official university boat race taking place in 1829. Ten years later, Henley's Royal Regatta began, both events attracting thousands of spectators along the banks. And they've been doing so ever since. Matthew Pinsent first started rowing at Eton College and during his time studying at Oxford University, he competed in the world-famous Oxford-Cambridge boat race, where he was part of the winning crew twice early on in his career. He went on to compete in four Olympic Games and has dominated the sport and the gold medal table, creating some of the most outstanding rowing partnerships and some of the most memorable sporting moments. In 2004, the Summer Olympic Games in Athens became the backdrop for one of the closest races in Olympic rowing history. It was the crowning glory of Matthew's athletic career. Matthew retired from competitive rowing in 2004, and he's still very involved in the sport as a commentator and umpire. He also uses his athletic drive and spirit to help motivate and inspire others towards greater success. Matthew, thank you so much for joining me here at the Leadership Meeting. A League. pleasure. And of course, we're here at the Oriel Kensington Rowing Club, where the yes. Oxford Cambridge races go past there, bringing back memories for you. The river here in London is possibly the most famous bit of rowing water, certainly in the UK. Um, and the Thames itself has so much rowing history. I mean, we're surrounded by it here um, that it, you can't help but to sort of hark back to races gone by and uh, wins and losses and training and all of that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very sort of redolent for me. You were about 13 mm -hmm. when you first sat in a boat. How did you know you wanted to be? I uh, was at Eton and in the summer term, they gave you a choice between cricket and rowing and I was rubbish at cricket. And that's about the long and short of it. It was nothing more than a pastime for, for at least probably three years, three, three summers. And they were lovely. It was a great start because, but you, 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 were, you were sort of playing really. Um, but that's almost the way every sport should start. It should be fun and it was, and it remains. When did you first know you wanted to really take it seriously as a profession? Did your parents support that? They were both very supportive. I don't think they really, you know, particularly understood what it was becoming for me, which was a passion and then a vocation. And then I had a year off between school and university, between Eton and Oxford, and all, all I did was row, which which again was, was wonderful, um, but it was, only, it was only one thing that I did. And I did, you know, essentially I only did one thing for a long part of my life, which, which felt very, very strange and sort of um, wasn't a normal CV by any stretch. Well, you were reading geography at St yes. Catharines at Oxford, mm -hmm. and that's where it seemed to then accelerate when you met Sir Steve Redgrave. I had spent my whole year off rowing at the same place that he was training in Henley, the same club, but it was full of people who had performed at the very highest level, at Olympic level. And I 
was then able to measure myself, I mean literally as well as technically, against them and him to be honest because he was the standard bearer for rowing in this country for the two Olympics. You know, they were all coming back from 1988 from South Korea, from Seoul and I was a sort of aspiring junior um, and suddenly there was a demonstration of what they were doing and what they were capable of and in lots of instances what I wasn't able to do. Um, but the gap between where I was and then where I wanted to be seemed smaller than the impression. And so then it was a matter for me of saying, right, if that's something I want to do, how can I get to that level? So you were starting really to dare to dream that mm. you could get there. Yes. And it took me a long time to realise in my own head my potential, I suppose. At club level, I had a coach then who, when I shared with him and said, look, you know, is it realistic to expect to go to the next games? And this was two, three years away. And him look at me, look at me quite strangely as if, well, of course it is. But I think he was surprised at how, how low my own expectation was. And suddenly it all happened very quickly in that Steve Redgrave, as double Olympic champion he was then, uh, sort of ran out of partners. His, his, his existing partner had a back injury and was sort of taken out for a year. And he was on the hunt for a new pairs partner. And, and I was on the short list of three. Still to come, from a short list of three to one winning team, the emotional and physical toll of winning four Olympic golds. After every gold medal that I won, I wept because it's too much to take in. The Leadership League, brought to you by Turkish Airlines. Welcome back to the Leadership League. I'm Tanya Bry here in London, where I've travelled to the River Thames to catch up with one of the all-time greatest champions of rowing. Matthew Pinsent's rise to sporting greatness began in 1990 when he was paired with a rower who already had Olympic pedigree. Steve Redgrave had won two world championships and two Olympic golds before being paired with Matthew for the world championships in Tasmania, Australia. They picked up bronze medals, losing out to the then powerhouses of rowing, East Germany and the Soviet Union. But it wasn't long before they were on golden form, winning the Coxless pairs in the 1991 World Championships and a 1992 Olympic gold in Barcelona. Pinsent and Redgrave were a winning combination. So was there a secret to their success? I think the short version is we are very alike. You become aligned into what's important, how you think about your rowing, how you goal set, how you forge this team. And it wasn't difficult for us to join forces and say, right, it was obvious. I mean, he'd won two Olympic gold medals before. And so there was going to be no mystery about the mission statement. We didn't have to sit around for ages and come up with a reason why we were there. And when we were put together as a partnership, it was 18 months, maybe a little more, sort of 20 months to go before Barcelona. Mm. And in sporting terms, that's not a long time. What was that moment like then when, <laughs> <laughs> when you won? Um, in some ways, it's a relief because even in 20 months, we had suddenly a, a head of expectation behind us. There's also elation, of course there is, and ecstatic sort of jumping around and celebrating and and weeping, I, you know, you don't, I, after every gold medal that I won, I wept, absolutely. And because it's, it's too much to, to take in. And then as soon as it's over, there is no plan, there is no structure. And then someone's saying, right, you know, in you come and you need to stand on the podium and here's a medal around your neck and here's the national anthem, all of which are amazing, but they pass, you know, in a sort of what feels like a split second. You suddenly find yourself four or five hours after the race in a little quiet moment, I went back to the Olympic Village and, and sat on the end of the bed with, with my medal in my hand and thought, right, there we are, that's it. How did your life change from that moment? Yeah. 
So I remember saying straight after that Barcelona race, in the press conference, in fact, I know what, are the, what one of the lines on my tombstone is going to be, and it's going to be Olympic champion, yeah. which is a sort of wonderful moment, but it then changes everything going forward. Well, it did, and of course you went on then to Atlanta to yes. defend your gold medal, winning another one. What was that four years like building up to that, Matthew? What sort of pressure did you feel? What kind of training did you have to do? So the rough outline of an Olympic week is 24 to 28 hours of training a week. So what's that? Divided by seven, you're talking three, four hours a day of exercise. This isn't warm up, it's not resting in between sessions. We would divide that up into two or three sessions in the day, start at eight in the morning, first one's done by 10, have a bit of a break, do something else around lunchtime, and then two or three times a week, you're going into the gym in the afternoon and doing weights or, or rowing machine or something like that. You're probably doing that for 47 or 48 weeks in the year and doing that year four times in a row. What you don't want to do is find you get halfway in between Olympics and, and suddenly decide this is too much. And Steve and I had said right at the beginning, you know, we want to go from Barcelona winning a gold medal to Atlanta to win a gold medal. And then Steve added the rider on, I want to win every gold, you know, every race in between the two that we do. And that just became harder and harder to do. So instead of being the young, untested combination that was coming up in the run-up to Barcelona, yeah. we were the established champions, we were the world record holders, we were the world champions, we were defending Olympic champions all the way through that period of time and it got heavier and heavier and heavier to carry that burden of what felt like that burden around in the run-up to Atlanta and, it, and it, it was draining. It was even more draining than it should have been. You were the ones to beat, so how did you keep that mental strength? I suppose you, you go back to your original decision, which is, why am I here? What are we trying to do? Win a gold medal. Uh, do you really want to do it? And fundamentally it was yes. And nothing, nothing to me sounded more fun than pursuing the Olympic dream. And then when you get to the other end of the Olympic moment and you're the far end, you're like, well, that was amazing because we said four years ago we were going to do this and here we are standing on the middle of the podium with a gold medal around our neck. So there's a huge feeling of accomplishment. It then by any measure had become an addiction to which I couldn't find a cure and I didn't want to find a cure. It was, you know, in Atlanta I was 25, Steve retired for what felt like five minutes and then came back and but but what we did between Atlanta and and Sydney was was change from a two-man boat into the four-man boat and that gave a huge injection of you know enthusiasm and uh, there's, a, there's just another two other factors in James Cracknell and Tim Foster who were coming in and that worked so well in the run-up to Sydney that it that it did feel different again. And when the four of you did win in yes. Sydney what, what was that like? Well that was a sea change for rowing in this country because it, Steve was the story. Winning five gold medals was unprecedented in rowing, unprecedented in the UK. It hadn't been done for decades. It certainly hadn't been done in an endurance sport. It captured the British imagination so that suddenly we had, you know, the TV execs coming up to us after our race in amongst everything else saying, we think 10 million people have just watched that race and it's one in the morning back at home. Which is, you know, it, it's that sort of off the scale. So Matthew, after you won the gold, yeah. the four of you, and of course, that, as you were saying, was unprecedented and yeah. the story around. Steve, then, then did you allow yourself a bit of time after yes. that? <laughs> so I had 10 weeks off after, after Sydney, um, which I'd never had off rowing, oh, I mean, since I was, 15 probably, 15 or 16. And so there, it felt like a huge break. And towards the end of that, I was really sort of drumming my fingers, waiting to get back to training. I was so hungry to go back. Did you find you had to work harder? And also, of course, you were doing it without Steve now. Yes, but that was a good, I wanted to prove that I could win without Steve. And 
and I also knew that it could be done because he had done it. Your wife, Dimitri, who you met at Oxford, yeah. how supportive was she and how important is that when you're trying to break all these records? <laughs> yeah, I mean, of, of course, from my point of view, it's vital. Um, it wasn't a normal, inverted commas, marriage at that point because, you know, in the sort of famous words, there was, there was three of us in that marriage and the, the third one was rowing. Yeah. It makes me wince now to think about it. You know, rowing, well, it does come first. I've got, you've got to say it. Like, you know, and so you'd have to look your wife in the eye and, and this is the calendar for rowing and there's no, there's no choice, there's no flexibility. We can't take a holiday there or I can't come with you to that event or that family function or whatever it might be. You're just steamrolling over, the, over all of it. That personal sacrifice continued until the nail-biting final of the 2004 Athens Olympics. That was the hardest Olympic race of my career, absolutely. Anything other than a gold medal is going to be a disaster. The Leadership League, brought to you by Turkish Airlines. Welcome back to the Leadership League. I'm Tanya Bry, and I'm here on the banks of the River Thames to meet up with one of Britain's most celebrated Olympians, Sir Matthew Pinsent. Matthew picked up his third Olympic gold in Sydney, but the race to secure a fourth in Athens in 2004 wasn't going to be easy. Rowing alongside new teammates James Cracknell, Ed Code and Steve Williams, the race came down to a photo finish. So that was the closest and hardest Olympic race of my career, absolutely. Because we were the underdogs, we hadn't got the same momentum that Steve and I had had in the run-up to those gold medals. We hadn't got the same winning record that the Sydney Four had running into Sydney. And what felt like a sort of throw-together boat and the towpath gossip, the rowing gossip, was nothing about us. And, and that was difficult. As much as I didn't like the feeling, the mantle of pressure back in the day when we'd been the favorite, suddenly being the underdog is no fun either. And I knew, look, anything other than a gold medal is gonna be a disaster. I couldn't imagine coming back from any Olympics at that stage of my career with three goals and saying, look, I'm just delighted with this silver. I just, yeah, I couldn't imagine that. You got your fourth gold, but yeah, exactly. It was at eight hundredth of a second or something yeah. whenever the Canadians. Those yeah. final moments, Matthew, what kept you going? How did you do it? I think the easiest way for me to distill it is if it had just been me on my own, then I would have stopped. Absolutely. Because, because you're right on the edge of what you could manage humanly, uh, physically. Um, and ultimately, it's the responsibility to your crewmates that's going to keep you going. We said we want to be able to look each other in the eye and know that we gave everything in order to win and in that final stretch of the race if you make a mistake or you stop doing something you really should be doing because you're tired it's not just going to cost you your gold medal it's going to cost them theirs. That is that's that's quite a responsibility and that is a very powerful um, motivating factor. It's the responsibility to your team and your crew at that particular moment that you don't want to let them down. And you didn't, and you no. won. What was that feeling like when you crossed over? And it was like... Well, that <laughs> properly is exhaustion. Yeah, because, because we'd been trying to develop a lead for minutes on end and eking out tiny little advantages. And then they had taken the lead away from us again. And then finally we we charged through with what 200, 300 meters to go, what felt at, the moment, at that moment like a decisive lead. And then they'd come back and back and back. And there was no moment of elation. It was just exhaustion and it all sort of falling in on me really. But I derive almost the most pride out of that race and those minutes after that race because it was so difficult for us to do. It wasn't just a replication of what we 
had done in training or the world championships the year before or you know we'd beaten these guys lots of times before we hadn't we hadn't done anything like that before we you know that crew had three races together the heat the semi-final and the final at the olympics and so it was a sort of perfect alignment of of people and moment and when you stood up on the podium with your gold medals what was that moment like? well i was almost hunched out couldn't hardly stand up <laughs> i know i was i was yeah. sort of in I was in tatters, I was, I was in bits. As never before, it was too much to take in. And I thought it had been, it had been all encompassing in Barcelona and Atlanta and Sydney before, but, it, but that was, yeah, next level again. You then made the decision not that long after to retire. Was mm. that a tough decision to make? I did think about it. Um, and I probably thought about it for two or three months after the games. I think my body knows it is done. As we said, in the, after Sydney, I was very keen to go back after two or three months. After Athens, I wasn't. I was done. I was done. And, and I was very ready to be retired from the sport and I was able to come out on my own terms. I wasn't injured or ill or dropped or dissatisfied in some way. No, I was ready to move on to other things and and be a better husband than I'd been for the last three years. It was just, yeah, it was time. It wasn't difficult at all. And of course, you haven't really left the sport because you're an umpire, you're also a commentator. Yeah. So you're very much involved. And Henley Regatta, is that, why is that special for you? Why do you think it's such a special event? Uh, Henley's a sort of wonderful combination of rowing and socialising and sort of pageant, I suppose. There's a lot of... You know, there's no other rowing event. I've got a whole series of blazers that I'll never wear anywhere else other than Henley. There's a sort of odd ceremony to it. And you know, in any given Henley week, I'll run into everybody from 25 years of, of rowing actively and more besides, and meet new people. And so it's sort of, it's wonderful. And of course, you're a motivational speaker as well. Mm. And how do you motivate? <laughs> what, is, what is the key? Well, it all comes... It all comes back to the, the central sort of pillars of rowing, which is it's a team sport, ultimate, the ultimate team sport is what people often say about it, because every constituent part of a rowing boat has got to be doing the same thing at the same time. There's an awful lot around goal setting and communicating properly with your teammate or your crewmates. Um, and then there's the test around performing under pressure when it matters most. So these are themes that come out again and again in a corporate environment. That's what rowing does, certainly Olympic rowing, on a daily basis. It's bread and butter for me to talk about. It's absolutely, it's a wonderful legacy for me, for my own career. The Thames may have been Matthew's second home throughout his career, but as I find out when we take a walk in the winter sunshine, the draw of the river is not what it once was. Are you sure? You don't want to see one, someone go by in a boat? You don't want to jump in? No, I just think, oh, that looks nice, and then walk yeah. on. But Hammersmith Bridge is so beautiful. Yeah. Such, yeah, I think it's one of the nicest bridges on the whole Thames. So this is a sort of, you know, a just ribbon of my rowing life all the way up to, <laughs> to Oxford and beyond. You've got three children. Yes. What if one of them said, oh, Dad, I'd love to go out and be a rower. Oh, great. No, go and do it. And, I, and, 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 and I'm fine with that. They can, I, I, I love the idea of them trying sport. And if rowing is one of them, then that's, then that's great. It wasn't anybody other than my decision. And I don't want to foist that on anybody else, least of all my children. Matthew, is it important for you to give back to your sport? I think so. My sport gave me so much through school and university and then beyond. It felt at the time quite selfish and quite sort of driven. I mean, there's no other way of doing it. And then since I've stopped in 2004, you know, if, if rowing ever asks me to do things, then of course I'm there. But also as a sort of official, as a sometimes a coach, but more often as an umpire, I'm there to volunteer at events and that's wonderful. You have these, these brothers, they're not your family, but they are sort of another form of family. They're your sporting family and, and you don't choose them going in. Uh, you get landed with them for the rest <laughs> of your life, come, come hell or high water. 
that's a real gift. That's a real bond that you'll never, never lose. Matthew, thank you so much. Such a pleasure. pleasure. Real pleasure. The Leadership League. Brought to you by Turkish Airlines.